The problems facing New Zealand's primary sector have been mounting at a rapid pace. So I think it's time for open hearts and open minds. Welcome to Cirrus Country's 2020 election special, live across multiple platforms, as we do every week, Monday to Wednesday, from 7pm, in alliance with the wonderful team at Farmers Weekly. But tonight, we are extending our broadcast with our friends on the NZ Farming Facebook page. Tonight's broadcast, collectively, on all platforms, is reaching well over 300,000 people tonight. I'm your host, Sarah Perry, no pet Gower or no Tova O'Brien, John Campbell or Hosking. Just a passionate Kiwi country girl who believes in supporting those that put their hands in the soil each day to improve our environment and our economy. And of course, the industry that daily wraps around them to grow the future of New Zealand's food and fibre sector. Now, this Saturday, 17th of October, New Zealand faces another monumental election result for not only our COVID recovery economically, but the result will reflect how the primary industry will feel about uh, doing the heavy lifting for each and every taxpayer. If you're new to Cirrus Country, uh, watching on the NZ Farming uh, Facebook page, good on you and welcome. We will have a lot of new fresh faces in the comments live below, which is your chance and your home to share with us your thoughts as you watch and listen over the next hour and a half of this election special. The five major political parties, uh, the agricultural spokespeople, will share their view on what I have selected as the far the five major issues facing the sector. Who is featuring? New Zealand's Labour Party's Minister of Agriculture, Damien O'Connor, New Zealand National Party's David Bennett, Green Party uh, of Aotearoa New Zealand, Eugenie Sage, New Zealand First's Mark Patterson, and ACT Party's Mark Cameron. Now, please note, uh, as I have had some requests for questions to the politicians, that I have structured this special uh, in not the form of a debate, and this is due to the remote video nature of accessing these politicians politicians in this last week as they are on their political campaigns in their local electorate. And of course the nature of COVID restrictions uh, at the last minute to pull together them all in the same room. So as we do on Sarah's Country and we do as the DNA of every Kiwi, we get on with what we've got to achieve the ultimate outcome. Now I have pre-recorded the answers to each of these five questions so as I said I won't be able to pose your questions to them live. Uh, however I love to hear your comments around them and I will go live to take your comments and share with them because that's what makes Sarah's country unique and different is that we are engaging live with our farming audience live across the world Monday to Wednesday from seven o'clock and then of course on demand on podcast the next day. I will go to uh, some experts that we talk as regular guests to on Sarah's Country. They will be the subject matter experts to conclude each of these five questions. I want their thoughts on, is it practical uh, to implement what these politicians are saying? Let alone, is it true? And then towards the end of the night, wrapping up with Farmers Weekly editor Brian Gibson to summarise everything that he has heard through his lens, dealing with rural news and opinions on a day daily basis. Now the most important thing throughout this election special is that we do hear from you live uh, on the matters that matter most. What are the biggest issues facing your family's lives and businesses right now? Is it wrapping your head around this freshwater quality, uh, freshwater policy, the price of strong wool, uh, the epidemic of the state of our rural mental health or the structure of science funding? They are major issues, but here on Serious Country, uh, every Monday to Wednesday each week, we do try to do this with an open mind and an open heart, bringing the opinions of our sector alongside the realities of our markets and our science developments. Now, also, how do you think it's going to land on Saturday night? I want to know what are the matters that matter most to you? Uh, what are some of those key policies that you keep out looking out for? And where do you think it's going to land on Saturday night? What's your predictions? What do you think of the makeup of this next government? Is it in the bag or do you think that uh, either party has equal chance? But for fun, 
tell me where you are watching around this beautiful country, Aotearoa, New Zealand, that we call home. And what's the weather doing? <laughs> Just out of interest. Always a fun thing. And of course, it's the most important thing. Let's be honest. Now, to kick off in the five largest issues that are facing the primary sector here in New Zealand, it would have to kick off with fresh water. So I took the time to ask our five agricultural spokespeople for the five major parties earlier this week. In August this year, the National Environmental Standards for Freshwater was introduced and set requirements for carrying out certain activities that poses risk to freshwater ecosystems. How will your party seek to achieve the outcomes of improving freshwater quality whilst balancing the profitability of the landowner? Sarah, we've rolled out um, new freshwater standards, national policy statement and national environment standards that lay out the temporary measures in place um, to stop any further water degradation. And uh, we went into government three years ago on the basis that we would make improvements in this area. National had rolled out an NPS. They're achieving or hoping to achieve weightable standards. Uh, the general consensus of that was not an not an adequate target, and so we set it at swimmable over a generation. There are some areas in the, in the country that have uh, degraded water. There are some high-risk catchments, and we've identified those. The vast majority of farmers across our country have been doing a, a huge amount over the last 20 to 30 years to improve uh, their general standards around uh, freshwater management, on-farm practice, uh, fencing waterways and all and the such like. But the reality is, in some areas, the quantum of, of dairy cows in particular um, has put pressure on waterways, and we're going to have to make progress there. We've committed um, to work through an implementation group with the regional councils to make sure that the temporary measures, such as consenting and, and where that is required, are realistic, but that we help farmers through national uh, through uh, farm plans, integrated farm plans where possible, uh, to get in place the appropriate measures for each and, and every uh, farm and farmer. Because as we know, on the ground, it's the work that, that farmers do ultimately that will protect the waterways and that's what we all want to achieve. David Bennett from the National Party. Yeah, it's been the most controversial part of the election campaign from a primary sector point of view around their freshwater standards. Everybody wants to have high freshwater standards and they want to have the ability to um, use the rivers as they wish to and um, and we're all going to have a much more sustainable focus as farmers going forward so those are givens it's just making sure that the rules are something that are compatible with what farmers can do are based on good science and take into account farming practices and farmers have not been able to see how they can actually apply them in practice uh, the winter stocking rates in the southland for example um, have sh shown to be tremendously difficult in a region where you have 100 days where there is no uh, grass growth, so you have to do winter stocking. Um, the nitrogen rules are going to have a major effect through the Canterbury and, um, and other regions where there's irrigation. So, um, and the slope and fencing rules, uh, the maps for those uh, have shown difficulty there as well. So what National wants to do is we want to work with farmers and farm organisations to develop rules that are fit for purpose that are practical and are scientific and not just set in Wellington. And we also want to give a degree of regional autonomy. Uh, so regions can mix and match um, to take into account uh, their, uh, their climatic conditions, their farming practices, um, and what they need to do to achieve what is required in their catchment. Eugenie Sage from the Green Party. Kia ora koutou katoa, na mihi nui kia koutou. Thank you uh, all for listening. The Greens know that for exporting our food and fibre products overseas, everyone relies on that 100% uh, clean green image. So the National Policy Statement for Fresh Water and the standards in it are about helping give integrity to that brand, which allows pre a premium for exports. And the National Policy Statement and the standards were developed with considerable input from uh, pharma stakeholders and we think they represent um, the best way to actually protect waterways to make them swimmable within a generation. And we know that farmers want swimmable water as well. And it's also the government's Jobs for Nature package, 700 million of that, which the Green Party totally supports, are going into improving sustainable land and water management. 
things like funds for nurseries, riparian planting, so that we can uh, buffer waterways better and uh, work to protect against erosion. So it's a whole range of solutions that are providing the support as well as the regulatory underpinning. Mark Cameron from the ACT Party. Look, the this, this simple reality is ACT, ACT supports both the desire to continue doing what, what farmers have done at a regional level so fastidiously well. I mean, sadly, what's happened in the current framework, the current government has, got, has looked through a myopic lens with a big umbrella approach to quite, quite difficult problems at a regional level. A lot of what's actually gone on in, in the space in and around freshwater, whether it's the pugging reality in Southland or the stock exclusion fencing, has often, a lot of these problems have actually been mitigated by farmers and council at regional and right at, at farm gate uh, levels. And as the ACT Party, we sit in support of that. Farmers are their own best stewards and conservationists of the land. So we want to create an environment where farmers can have a tailored solution driven by industry. Uh, the, the narrative shared by a council level reality and, and let farmers um, continue their own best endeavours because they're the best at it. The current framework from the current government in many instances uh, is not just simply not tenable. Mark Patterson from the New Zealand First Party. I mean, we support the direction of travel. There's no doubt about that. I think the recent lower figures that came out suggested that, you know, we still have work to do and we've got to be at best practice at scale. Um, and despite, you know, the great work that's going on on farm, uh, you know, we just haven't seen a turnaround in those figures yet. Um, but having said that, I'm on record and New Zealand First on record as saying, as, as originally introduced, they're uh, unworkable and impractical. Uh, we have seen some changes, which has been good, and we lobbied uh, for those. But I think there's probably four specific areas where we would like to, to see some amendments uh, and like to influence some change. I mean, the pugging rule, uh, that 50% um, you know, and less than uh, uh, five uh, centimetres is just impractical and, and you know, try working that in South on that moment after flooding events. So that does have to be amended. The re-sowing dates need some flexibility, um, you know, for the very same uh, reasons. The DIN levels, uh, you know, there's some real danger there if you, particularly if we get a Labour Green government, that they're going to come down quite hard and they're not settled yet. I might uh, remind everyone, but I guess one of the main areas around compliance is to get immediately to uh, certified farm environment plans rather than uh, resource consenting, which is a bit of a, a blunt tool and, um, you know, pretty compliance heavy potentially, whereas if we can knit that into a wider farm environment plans, which I think we've got till 2022 to do that, uh, we've got some existing rights uh, in terms of winter cropping and that uh, through the RMA, so 2021 we can handle, 2022 in our view we should be able to have those uh, certified farm environment plans up to to cut that compliance. All right, we have heard there in our very first question to our five agricultural spokespeople uh, for the five major political parties here ahead of the 2020 New Zealand election this Saturday. And of course, it would have to be around fresh water to kick us off. I ask them, if you've just joined us, how would your party seek to achieve the outcomes of improving fresh water quality whilst ba balancing the profitability of landowners. What I felt not a lot of them got that last part straight off the bat and uh, to predictable to point uh, in terms of different alliances. Throughout Sarah's Country's uh, election special, we will be joined by expert commentators uh, from the industry who live and breathe each of these topics every single day to get their thoughts and summarise what they have just heard. So for Freshwater, on Sarah's Country, uh, Monday through Wednesday, every week in Alliance with Farmers Weekly, I love to have a chat to Land Pro's Kate Scott on these moving regulations to keep farmers up to date. And Kate joins us now. Kate, well, I'm just going to work through a couple of the comments that I've made note on down below. 
Firstly, what stood out for me was a very bold comment from Eugenie Sage that these freshwater regulations were brought in with huge consultation from farmers. Yeah, look, Sarah, that was uh, certainly something that stood out for me as well. Um, I was listening to um, Ms Sage say that there was considerable input from farmer uh, and stakeholders and at that point um, thought that, yes, the process did take some time, but I'm not convinced that I would probably share the same view that there was, um, you know, huge input and or even great, um, you know, engagement around the way that they actually undertook consultation at, you know, the busiest time of year uh, last year in, in terms of getting that input. So I, I didn't probably share the same view as, as Ms Sage did on that. Mm. And, uh, and of course, Damien O'Connor has said that he's very proud of an implementation group with regional councils to help farmers through their integrated farm plans. I mean, we're only talking within the last month or two around detail, but you live and breathe this on the ground every day talking between regional councils and farmers. And is this true? Is this implementation group uh, actually tangibly going to help farmers through navigating a regulation which potentially could change again? Yeah, look, I think um, like all of these things, the proof's going to be in the pudding, right? So this group, as far as I'm aware, has only recently convened and we haven't seen any of the detail coming out around how they suggest that it's going to be implemented. And I think it's a bit of a, a stretch to suggest that they're, you know, that they've solved all the problems yet because we haven't seen that. So look, I, I have every faith that they will come together and, and work well together to try and find ways to implement it. But for me, it actually comes back to the fact that perhaps had we have taken a little bit of time at the outset and made sure that these regulations were drafted in a, in a practical and pragmatic way, we might not have to have kind of gone back to the beginning to, to, to work out how we're going to implement it. So sometimes a little bit of uh, you know, time up front can, can avoid all these uh, back-end changes that now need to happen. Now, of course, no surprises there with regards to National saying very proudly around their national policy statement for fresh water uh, in terms of what Labor, Green, New Zealand First Coalition government inherited. How far have we actually come from uh, three years ago on fresh water regulations? Yeah, so the um, new national policy statement um, I guess strengthens the, the earlier 2014 version um, and the concept of Tamana Otawai was already framed out in that but what we've seen in this new version is it's brought more detail to that so this whole hierarchy of, of use so the you know to, to the values of the river first and then to, to the people and then to all the other uses. So that's the detail that has actually come about in this newest version. So I think we have moved further along. Um, and I guess the question remains to be seen how the councils now go about and implement this as they have to go, go through updating all of their regional plans. And, you know, that's still um, a process that we've got to see roll out. And I guess one of the interesting things that I think... Um, you know, Miss Sage talked about in her comments was about the fact that, um, you know, we ha we needed to see, um, you know, we needed to see um, change happening over a generation. Yet, to me, the NPS doesn't really talk about timeframes or generations. Um, the only the only mention of a time frame that it actually has in there is it says that councils must identify a time frame to achieve the goals that that they set. So. It's all very well talking about this being generational change, but but what is the what is the actual time frame to to ensure that our farming and and agricultural businesses can remain profitable, but also give effect to you know good environmental outcomes? And I thought you know it was pretty interesting that all of our um, spokespeople today didn't actually cover off the second part of your question around how we balance the need for a strong environment alongside profitable farm businesses. Mm -hmm, absolutely, and. Of course, Mark Patterson's backyard is most affected by being effectively told how to farm through these rules. And this is a, through Otago and Southland, the pugging rules, and when to have crops in the ground. Uh, how do you feel that not having New Zealand first a part of a potential Labour Green government uh, will really genuinely affect some of that uh, pragmatic approach to the actual understanding of being able to implement this on farm? Yeah, look, I think um, 
I mean, obviously, Mark, he's he's outlined that, you know, he sees, you know, the pugging and the reselling dates as areas that need further refinement. And I guess, you know, one of my first questions might be, well, look, you know, they've also been, New Zealand First have been part of the government and presumably have had input into the creation of these standards and, and rules up until this point. So if it was, you know, such an issue for them now, why was it not raised at the time? And, and who knows what goes on in the back end. But Similarly, I think to, to also give credit to um, Minister O'Connor, he has also talked about the fact that there are some impractical aspects of the rules as they've been drafted um, and as they lie now. So look, I think that the optimist in me hopes that we will actually um, see some refinement, especially to the pugging and to the, the sewing dates. I mean, we only have to look at what's been happening down here in Otago and Southland over the last couple of um, weeks we've had you know, 20 odd degrees, we've had frost fighting, we've had snow. And, and I can say now that no one's probably going to be in a position to be planting their crops come the 1st of November. So so here's hoping that we, we see some pragmatism, whichever government um, is elected after the 17th of October, and, and we see some, some real practical application of the rules. And we do have to make point, it's our first introduction to our five agricultural spokespeople, one of which you would have just seen there, not a lot of people may have been introduced to, which is the ACT agricultural spokesman, Mark uh, Cameron, that really stood out and said farmers are the best stewards of their environment. And you know what? Uh, Mark is actually a dairy farmer in Northland. How much of uh, politicians having general rural connection and actively working uh, in the farming and community, bringing that forward now, Kate, do you think that we're really lacking in terms of uh, a rural spot, a voice within this next government? I mean, ACT, if they get in with, say, 11 seats, they still do have Mark in there um, to be able to represent, regardless of whether ACT are in the forming part of that government or not. Yeah, look, I think obviously whatever the issue might be, whether it's agricultural issues or it's um, climate change or whether it's small business, certainly having people um, sitting around the table who have first-hand experience of that is always going to enrich the conversation because you can actually bring a real-world perspective to that. So, look, I think, you know, the, the more people who, who can sit around that table, you know, connect, you know, the better outcomes we're likely to have. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, the, the other interesting thing, you know, that, that I've taken from, from what all of our um, spokespeople have said today is that if you look at it, what each of them have said on their own and you could pick and choose, you know, all the, the important bits that, that they actually bring to the table, I think you'd end up with such great outcomes. You know, I think um, the point that Eugenie made about the fact that we need to make sure that we're trading on our brand and we need to demonstrate that, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think you'd find most of industry support you know, the, the direction of travel. But my question is, is the NES and the NPS the right approach to actually achieve that? And is it going to create the transparency? And is it going to create the value add that we think it might? So if you could take that and you could take the points that, that Mark Cameron made around the stewardship on the ground and you could take, um, you know, Mark Patterson's piece around the fact that we actually need to be, you know, more pragmatic and bring forward our farm environment plans more quickly and, and the work that Damien's already crafted, then all of a sudden we kind of ha- have potentially a really great outcome, but it's, it's how do you remove the, the politics that falls in the middle, I guess, to, to get to that point. Mm, absolutely. Lastly, Kate, before you go, how far have we come since water was the big political football of the 2017 election? Um, look, I think it certainly has um, heated up since 2017, um, and I think if I was uh, a betting person, I might place bets that uh, during this next term of government, we're only going to continue to see, you know, more focus on on water and and the challenges around, um, you know, how we use it, what it looks like, where we should use it, and and how we make sure that we actually look after it. So I'm. I'm uh, fairly certain it's not a topic that's going away anytime soon. Thank you so much, Kate Scott, Managing Director of LandPro.
Now, I want to say a big warm welcome if you've just joined us live on Sarah's Country. Uh, we have broadcast it live tonight with our lovely friends over at NZ Farming Facebook page. Uh, we produce Sarah's Country in alliance with the team at Farmers Weekly, Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday, every week from 7pm. And tonight on our election special, we have an extended hour and a half coverage covering the five major uh, issues facing the primary sector to the five political parties, agricultural spokespeople. For those uh, who didn't catch it at the start, they are pre-recorded and I don't have the ability to ask these politicians live your questions. However, I do want your comments. It's purely the nature of being able to pull something like this together through remote video in a COVID environment, as you can probably appreciate. However, I feel that regardless of who is in power post Saturday's election, it is great to ha- understand all the depth and give them the ability to explain where they stand on each and every policy. And I want to hear from you and I'm hearing from you live down on the laptop here. It's absolutely fantastic. Send me through your comments wherever you are watching live. Number one, uh, easiest question to ask. Yes, we are broadcasting live on YouTube. Search Farmers Weekly on YouTube or Sarah's Country and you can bring that up on your big smart TV. Uh, Chromecast it across. Wonderful to see where you are watching live. Please put that in the comments below. What's the weather doing? And John is joining us from beautiful Papa Moa in, uh, near Mount Monganui. Dennis uh, viewing in from Taupo. Rachel from a rainy wind whistle in Selwyn. It's drizzling out here in Lincoln as well, Rach. Uh, Jock for a mean, cold, dry southerly in Waimati. Ooh, I bet it's got a bite to it, uh, Jock. Now let's get into some of the comments from what we've heard on fresh water. You certainly... Been fantastic in commenting below. Where do I start? Straight away, Nathan says, what are the parties going to do about cities' waterways? They are dirtier than the country's ones. Uh, Sally has said that within many regions, there are already plans in place. We have a whole farm plan with Horizons Regional Council, and reality is that it takes time to fence and put in these reticulated water. After 10 years, they're still working on it. Uh, And another comment I found interesting here as well was from Richard around the size of um, farms increasing and, uh, of course, corporate baskets getting bigger and bigger and the little guys losing out because of what he's described as white-collar compliance teams. Uh, And Logan has said there was a vegan activist on the panel on the freshwater policy as well. That's disgusting in his view. And Jono says riparian strips and fencing waterways are just more band-aids. So systemically, a larger problem, I'm taking that from Jono as his point. And uh, I do want to point, Jill said uh, to band together and rip the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals out of our local councils. We don't vote for the UN, she says. And some more, letting us know where you are watching live. I absolutely love to see this. We have Steve from to, uh, Overcast and Cold Tamuka. Joe from Darfield. Bruce is, uh, Bruce, let us know. Bruce is watching from Perth. What's the temperature doing in Perth, Bruce? Lauren, a bloody cold in Ranfurly. And Miserable in Culverden from Logan. God, where's the sunshine in this country? Um, It's nice to see some moisture going across, uh, especially as we're going into an unpredictable spring again. I am your host here on Serious Country, Sarah Perriam, and it's a privilege to bring you this election special. The second issue that I put to our five agricultural uh, spokespeople is around the Zero Carbon Act and more so the flow-on effect in plantation, blanket plantation forestry forestry of uh, of pine trees and the effect that has had uh, across many parts of the country. The current coalition government's Zero Carbon Bill passed with a near unanimous support in November last year. I asked each of them, how would your party's policies seek to use sound science to encourage and measure carbon sequestration options? And what is your approach to an overseas ownership of forestry and the international offsetting of their carbon emissions? 
Hey, Waka Ekanao is, is quite a historic, uh, I guess, a partnership between industry and government, um, bringing on board all the officials and, and scientists. There's an independent group working through that. Uh, they've got to work on, on the ways of measuring on-farm emissions, making sure that we can look at soil where possible, uh, riparian planting, small uh, woodlots. And so that's a, an independent process underway, and they will be giving us some advice prior to Christmas on how we can get alongside farmers and start to measure measure what's happening on farm. Once we start to measure, then I'm sure that farmers with the right knowledge and all backed by science, absolutely as you say, uh, they will make the adjustments to try and reduce their emissions over time. The 10% retarget by uh, 2030 is, is realistically achievable uh, in talking with most farmers. They realised that with good efficiency grains, uh, gains with um, pasture species, with uh, better breeding, all of those things we can get to the 10%. Uh, the Climate Change Commission will set the next target level based on the science and based on the practicalities of that. Um, forestry is one way of offsetting, but we are, are not going to allow um, um, plant farms to be purchased and planted. Anything under class five will have to go uh, through a, a, a checking process. The National Environment Standard laid down by the previous government basically allowed uh, forestry to be planted anywhere without any uh, checks. We believe the council should have the ability to say, no, we don't think that that farm that's uh, class five and under a better quality land should be able to be planted. David Bennett from the National Party. Well, that's probably the second biggest issue we've felt during the campaign, and that's about uh, forestry and the implications on farmland um, uh, throughout New Zealand, and especially in the East Coast and the Wairapa regions. Um, it's a very hot issue there with farmland being taken out of sheep and beef um, and potentially into forestry. Uh, so we've made it very clear that um, we're going to remove that that. Ex exemption that's in the Overseas Investment Act, which gives a streamlined process for overseas investors that want to buy land for forestry purposes or forestry um, rights. So uh, essentially the, the government brought in a ban on overseas buyers, but gave an exemption in there for forestry. We want to take that out. Um, that's about 11 to 14,000 hectares uh, of land that has been bought under that exemption. So that's a significant change. The second bit is um, the really important one in the sense that this is the scale opportunity and that's around the offsetting provisions. So at the moment, CO2 emitters can um, buy a bit of land, put forestry on it and offset um, that against their emissions. Uh, New Zealand's one of the few countries that allow that to happen. And um, you know, we want to review that. So uh, we're putting people on notice effectively that um, those rule rules will be reviewed. And, um, and take into account uh, what we need to see to make sure there's a balanced approach um, in the economy. Now, in no way is that uh, to the detriment of forestry as such. You know, plantation forestry is an important part of our primary sector. Um, a lot of farmers have diversified income streams, including forestry on their properties, and, um, and we're not trying to discourage that at all. Um, but what we are looking at is where companies are using that offset provision uh, by buying um, pasture land to, to plant trees. And when we did the Zero Carbon Act, we uh, made seven or eight changes that uh, we wanted to see to that legislation. And one of those was around the forestry offsets. Uh, we wanted to review uh, those rules to make sure that they are fit for purpose. So although we did vote for the Zero Carbon Act, and, um, and I think you know, as you said, near unanimous support. Um, and it needs to happen for the sake of New Zealand and, the, and any exporter will tell you if we didn't do it, then we'd probably be in trouble with our export markets. But we also need to make sure it's practical. And those seven points that we raised are areas where we think the bill overstepped the mark um, or needed to be reviewed. And one of them certainly is gonna be around forestry offsets. Eugenie Sage from the Green Party. Kia ora, so I know that Beef and lamb for a long time has wanted the ETS changed so that things like riparian planting, uh, areas of indigenous vegetation on farm can be recognised in terms of their carbon uh, credits. And the Greens are proposing reform of the ETS and it's those sorts of issues that need to be taken uh, into account so that everyone who's got really good um, opportunities to sequester carbon, that that uh, gets 
as part of the ETS and be, can be recognised there so that you've got that income stream as well. Then in terms of overseas ownership, the changes to the Overseas Investment Act were made in response to um, New Zealand First desire for a billion trees and uh, having more tree planting occurring throughout Aotearoa for carbon sequestration. Recognise though that that easy path for overseas companies has led to several thousand hectares um, of land uh, going into forestry, farmland uh, going to forestry. Some of the transactions have been by overseas companies uh, that are already forestry companies because they make up 70% of our forestry industry, buying um, and selling between themselves. But the Green Party believes that we do need any overseas companies buying land for forestry to face the the same substantial and identifiable benefit to New Zealand test that overseas individuals or companies buying land for farmland um, have to uh, meet. Mark Cameron from the ACT Party. Well, the, the first thing that we as the ACT Party would address is, is how the methane has been brought into the whole ETS trading reality. We follow to follow the science. I mean, the simple science is, is that the GWP100 model has included methane targeting inside that, 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 that um, the onerous policy, I suppose, is the best way to frame it. We want to use GWP STAR, which is a methodology that removes methane targeting out of any climate off, or CO2 offsets. They've been treated by the, as the same gas. And the simple reality is we want to follow the science because we know they're not. The, when you talk about the afforestation that seems to be going at a greater speed of knots, well, what the ACT Party is actually deeply concerned about the expeditious nature of policy making out of the current government, which has, has, has tipped the scales in an, unlevel, in an unlevel playing field. We believe that there's a, there's a subsidisation to promote forestry going in. Farmers and, 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 and heavy industry cannot use offsets ashore, offshore to create fiscal offsets offshore when it comes to CO2. We think that's egregious. I mean, we we want to set um, our prices in around CO2 with our with our major trading partners. Currently, at thirty five dollars a ton, when the likes of China and Australia is anywhere between three and eight bucks, is really not is really not um, a level playing field. Mark Patterson from the New Zealand First Party. Yeah, well, we've been big supporters of the Hawaka Ekanoa. Uh, initiative that essentially does give uh, you know farmers and the government uh, the forum to to work out how farming might come into an ETS. Uh, we did negotiate on the coalition agreement that if it does come in, it's only at 95 uh, percent, and any money raised goes directly into to science and uh, mitigating science uh, funding. Um, you know, you've got your vaccines, your additives, your feed additives, your rye grasses potentially, which we would like to see trialled. Uh, so we'd be right behind that. Uh, in terms of the offsetting of the forestry, uh, we have been behind the, the billion trees, which does have some pretty strict criteria around it in terms of afforestation and, and how much you can do and where you can do it. Um, the overseas carve out has been a bit uh, problematic, I guess. We, essentially 72% of um, uh, forestry is owned by overseas interest already. Many of those have got integrated supply chains, so that the idea of the carve out was to have, to give them access to, um, you know, to supplies of timber and, and allow them to have the confidence to invest. At this stage, there's only, the latest figures, about 11,000 hectares uh, being taken up for that to go into actual forestry. Uh, so, but if we saw it moving to a, a level where it was, um, you know, looking like it was going to be dangerous in terms of too wide a forestation, we would look to move on that definitely. Wonderful. The other thing I'd say on that is that we have made, uh, I'm really proud that we have um, tightened the criteria for overseas investment in farmland and strategic assets considerably under this government, which is called New Zealand First Policy. This is Sarah's Country. 
Now, welcome to those who may have just joined the live stream here on Sirius Country's 2020 election special. We are broadcasting wide across the web, and tonight, in alliance with our new friends at Farm, uh, sorry, NZ Farming Facebook page, and of course, our great friends, Farmers in Alliance with Farmers Weekly. Um, <laughs> continuing on this weather pattern. Uh, it is certainly hitting down south. Cold sleet and hail in Five Rivers in Southland. Uh, snowing and hail in Mosburn at the moment. Snowing in Burke's Pass. However, I have found sunshine. It looks like it is all up towards the north. Fine, Annette says, in Dargaville. And uh, Casey is watching from the west coast of the North Island. Uh, steaming in on, in on the big screen via Chromecast, Sarah. And Jenny said that she's, oh, Jessie, sorry, finally figured out how to Chromecast on YouTube. That is, of course, if you search Farmers Weekly or Sarah's Country on YouTube, you can, of course, Chromecast us. Getting to some of your comments and then I will uh, uh, get underway with uh, our next guest to summarise that. Linda says we're pretty much carbon free anyway. What about our trees and scrub and all the grass we grow? Uh, Mark said, wonder if they will listen to the beef and lamb study from last week. Yes, and uh, we certainly featured uh, Bradley Case, the lecturer from AUT on Serious Country, can listen back on podcast about the study, proving that he believes it's time for recognition that our sheep and beef farmers are already, if not neutral. So Mark, thank you for your comment on that. Uh, Logan has brought into the point about grass and crops and Justin's brought into the conversation around hemp. But I do want to uh, point out Grant's comment. Politicians need to abide by Article 2 of Paris Accord. The 0.17% of global GHG emissions we admit is not going to impact global outcomes. While we shouldn't ignore this issue, we shouldn't move quicker than our main trading partners. Our five main trading partners contribute 48% of GHGs, this is greenhouse gas, uh, and it would be good to have some perspective on this. Let's not legislate our farmers out of the business, and we are going to cross to one of those farmers and uh, who is extremely educated and a great commentator on this debate around the Zero Carbon Act and the effect it's been having on her local community in Gisborne. We welcome to the show Kerry Warsnop. Evening, Kerry. Uh, good evening. How are you? Good. I've made a couple of notes, as I would you have from what <laughs> you've just heard. Hey, let's go straight into Greens throwing New Zealand first under the bus. It's their fault. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they certainly, they certainly did, didn't they? I took that out of uh, out of that as well. Um, essentially, all, all laying it at Shane Jones' feet. Um, oh, what's quite interesting, though, is that New Zealand First actually seems to have um, owned that blame. <laughs> I, I kind of felt like there was a, a sort of apologetic tone to the uh, New Zealand First uh, conversation. But um, interesting, the Greens are picking up, uh, I guess, the baton in terms of foreign ownership uh, and, and saying, you know, look, maybe uh, maybe we want to look at making it a level playing field between uh, the, the uh, I guess, the test for investment in New Zealand farmland. What that would do, to my mind, is probably just about rule it out because we've seen, uh, essentially, foreign ownership in farmland has almost been ruled out under the um, the higher threshold that's been brought in with this government. So uh, I guess that was the takeaway from uh, what the Green Party had to say on this topic. They were, I guess, silent on, on the scientific a- aspects of the question, uh, I definitely didn't hear anything in there about communities. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I would say um, probably what wasn't said was more significant than what was in a lot of areas. Oh, it is in politics in general, Kerry. Um, let's get to Mark Cameron. He was straight <laughs> off the back, straight into science and the methane calculation that we're using, encouraging the GWP star methodology. This is Mark Cameron from ACT. Um, for those who are not familiar around what we're calculating and what scientific um, methodology we're using, why is this important? Uh, so for the international um, agreements, typically there's, a, there's an agreed metric that everybody is supposed to apply. And uh, for a long time, that has been accepted to be uh, GWP 100. What, what that does is it, it tries to equate methane, which is very different 
to carbon dioxide. It, it tries to come up with essentially something that can make them comparable or can give an idea of um, the relative impact uh, of methane in the context of carbon dioxide. The reality is it's very, very difficult and messy to try and do that, and you do end up with a lot of um, inaccuracies. It's reasonably well acknowledged, and I think there's an awful lot of um, support internationally growing uh, in terms of a push to, particularly for methane, use use a metric that actually reflects the warming impact of methane. Um, what it does uh, in, in an environment where methane emissions are decreasing, GWP relative to GWP star actually overstates the, the likely warming impact. So um, quite happy to see a politician, um, uh, you know, Mark, I, I take my hat off to him. It's, it's quite a difficult thing to wrap your head around. He's obviously uh, taken the time to, to really go through the science. I did notice they, they were really the only, um, the only people to talk about the fact that policy has been quite yeah, expeditious. Um, I, I would second that. I think a lot of the fish hooks that we have in the ETS currently are there because we didn't take long enough to do a good job of it. Um, he also was pretty straight up about the fact that in its current form, the ETS works as a subsidy mm. uh, for the forest sector. Um, I didn't, I didn't get that kind of narrative from anybody else. I think they've they've definitely um, done a better job of cutting to the chase. Yeah, well, I, I did actually make note that David Bennett from National said that New Zealand is one of the few countries in the world for international companies to buy our land and offset their international mm. carbon credits, and he said he'd put a stop to that mm. straight away. Yeah, yep, uh, I, I did pick up on that. Um, I think there's a lot of merit broadly in in what's being said there, I think the, the the issue I come back to is how many times the word review is used, right? So so when, when you're really talking about um, an election and you really want my vote, I want to know exactly what it is that, that you are going to change. I, I don't want to know what you're going to think about changing. Um, and so I think for, you know, as a means of mobilising people to get out and vote national, uh, I, I think they could have had a much stronger stance. Uh, I, I think probably X done themselves a lot of favours by being very specific about what they don't like. Um, I, I would I would say that you know reviewing offsets is a, is a massive massive part of what the ETS's problem is right now. But we we needed them to come out with quite a strong position on on what that would look like under a national government. And um, I think they could have gone a little bit further there, mm, uh, to be honest. It's interesting. Uh, but, I have a brought, sorry, Kira. I've got a comment here about: Do you think that national will open the floodgates to foreign investment in farmland and forestry? Mm. It's interesting that question coming in after that. Yeah, I, I interesting. Whoever whoever put that in there, um, I I think that was quite possible to read into um, the, the little spiel we got uh, from the National Party because they completely steered away from that question. And uh, while we had it from a number of our other speakers, uh, we did not really get any, any comment on, on whether or not National was uh, looking to reopen to international, um, you know, uh, international purchases of farmland. Uh, I know the narrative has been that they, they want the level playing field to persist. So um, whether or not that means opening it up to everyone or shutting it down for everyone uh, remains kind of unclear, I think, from what we just heard. Mm. And let's go to Minister for Agriculture, Damien O'Connor, straight off the back saying, look, I saw the consequences of what was going on with my coalition partners and we, Labour, stepped in to ensure regional councils have this power uh, of anything under Class 5. Is that practical? Is uh, is it being you know actually implemented? And what is the other side of it that we're hearing of you know marginal land is actually quality land for young farmers to get into? Mm. Yeah, it's really interesting. I really wonder if Damien knows how much uh, how much class 
six and seven land some of our regions have. Uh, for some of our regions, it's almost all of their land. Uh, so does it make it acceptable essentially for, for some regions to um, become forests simply by Dean of not having enough class five or, or less land? Uh, I think probably a, a an equally big issue in terms of um, the fact that so much land is not captured by this requirement to get a resource consent is the fact that simply requiring council to issue resource consents on top of the enormous, absolutely incredible body of work that is going to come out of the freshwater reforms, you know, it, it's just a case really, it seems to me, of, of saying, well, look, we don't want to deal with it here. Regional councils can deal with it. Um, actually, you know, the Labour Party is the government. Um, they may well be the government following the election. And if that's the case, then it is in their hands to deal with the root cause of this problem at its source, rather than uh, palming off these difficult and no doubt potentially very litigious decisions to regional councils. Mm, absolutely, 100% feel for anybody that is working uh, within a regional council around New Zealand. Um, I hope you have some hair left, and if it is left, it hasn't fully gone <laughs> grey. <laughs> it it's, a, it's, it's a very trying yeah. time for them. I know. I, I think um, I think the Labour Party and potentially New Zealand First have. I think they've really. It's, they've taken on board this Hiwaka Iki Noa as their own um, brainchild uh, to a certain degree. You know, I think uh, for me, I um, I get my back up a little bit about that. The industry actually led that. The the proposals of this government were were not this collaborative model that the industry has driven. So um, at the moment, we we are working to incredibly tight timeframes in order to mit- Uh, meet all of the milestones that have been set for that project. And if those milestones are not met, the the government retains the uh, ability to essentially revert to what was the status quo, which is to essentially tax us all at the processor level. So I I don't think they can lean really hard into Hiwaka Ikenoa as, uh, as, you know, something that, that they've, you know, created, because actually, uh, you know, the industry created that, and it remains to be seen if we manage to pull it off. So um, focusing on that area to a certain degree, I think, is a bit of a means of deflecting from some of the areas they're less keen to talk about, which uh, I think you've heard you've heard the opposition parties quite prepared, particularly ACT, to talk about those areas. Oh, Kerry, I'm getting some wonderful comments I can see here on the laptop about how you're a great spokesperson for the industry and wonderful, wonderfully <laughs> speaking about this topic. Of course, uh, two out of five of my expert guests commentating around uh, what our political parties are saying on the five major issues that I am putting to them. I'm going to go down to some of your comments now live. Uh, we are broadcasting now on NZ Farming Facebook page as well as an alliance with our fantastic strategic partners uh, Farmers Weekly. You can watch us via YouTube as well uh, Farmers Weekly or Sarah's Country's YouTube channel. Put us up on the big screen as well as there is a live audio feed. If you're out in the car, go to sarahscountry.com and you can listen there If you've missed anything, we are always on demand on podcast which is our most popular way of consuming this show Now I'm going to get down to some of these uh, Why is our country that's why our country, it's a win-win carbon credits, get more job, sorry, I can't read that one out, allowing carbon offsets by allowing overseas companies to buy our farmland and put into trees is only exuberating the issue. It is basically allowing dirty industries overseas to use our farmland to offset their carbon emissions. Thank you, Katrina. And uh, Mark has said, at least we will still have farms and how many will throw in the towel if Greens throw the hammer down on us from Mark. Hey, um, I'd love some positivity in the comments below. 
simply let me know where you're watching around the country or around the world because Sarah's Country is consumed by a lot of people in the Northern Hemisphere over their breakfast time as they are getting their day started and they're looking to the bottom of the world for how we go about doing things. Uh, And our next topic, I am always following how much we're putting into our agricultural science. There is the Sustainable um, Farming Future Fund, the SFFFF, which is a lot of Fs, supports applied research and projects led by farmers and growers, foresters, as well as MPI, uh, the Ministry for Primary Industries, to support and enhance our natural resources like water and soil, and to encourage research into innovation in areas such as climate change and fisheries management. I asked our five political agricultural spokespeople, how would your party support our innovators to commercialise our science technology globally? Well, the $40 million fund that's SFFF um, is available for um, farmers and, and people involved with agribusiness uh, to be at the leading edge of innovation. Uh, we don't want to pay that money out just for business as usual. Uh, there are lots of people with great ideas out there, and that fund is available for them to apply. Um, all primary sectors are able to access that. And so, you know, we've been encouraging people as we go around the country um, to, to apply for SFFF to complement what the money that's going on in other parts of the economy through the CRIs, through the universities. Uh, we're spending hundreds of millions of dollars literally in the area of, of primary production. Um, and we've seen it, uh, this money going into fishing, uh, a lot into forestry. Uh, we need to better understand our soil and our water management. And so where we've had good um, research and development in the past, sometimes that knowledge has been kind of uh, thrown to the winds. We haven't been able to gather it. And one of the commitments around our extension services from MPI's perspective is to gather that information in one place, make it readily available for both farm advisors and for farmers. Um, So that way we'll get best practice out on farm um, through um, online, of course, uh, which is the new way, but through discussion groups and as we've seen in the past. David Bennett from the National Party. Well, I think it's a it's it's a delicate balance there as well. Like um, we want to have the best science and uh, technology in New Zealand, and at the same time, um, we also want to protect that science and technology uh, from our competitors. And so um, there is an element of balancing that, um, and that's why we have trademarks and patents and things like that, uh, so people can keep their technology and get the rights to it. Uh, but fundamentally, uh, we are in an open world. And uh, we use other countries' technology to our advantage, and they will use ours as well. And uh, there's a huge agri-tech business that's out there. Um, You know, you just have to look at my hometown of Hamilton with Gallagher's um, a fundamental New Zealand business uh, that's that's grown out of the agri-sector and now is a, a conglomerate around the world. And so we've got a very strong tech policy uh, that's looking at being a minister of technology, scholarships, um, a particular visa around that area and um, you know to encourage people into those STEM subjects. Uh, but we also want to work with the Agritech Transformation Plan. So they released that earlier this year. And uh, that's a really strong plan by the sector around how they want to grow um, and make sure they can use more of the robotics, the artificial intelligence and um, the technology that's becoming available on farms. So uh, we see a dual process there, our tech plan, plus also the agri-tech sector's transformation plan. If we work those two together, uh, we should be able to give the, the resourcing and also the leadership uh, to enable us to have continue to have the best technology on farm in New Zealand, but also to be world leaders in that area as well. Eugenie Sage from the Green Party. Well, the Greens believe that it's not just a focus on these funds to um, promote innovation. We think you need to do some more research on natural systems so that there's a better understanding of the changes that we make in land management and what impacts they have on waterways, for example. So I think previously the fund has over-focused on innovation and not enough on just a better understanding of natural systems, what we can do to sequester more carbon, what we can do to have healthier soils, better mycorrhiza and other microorganisms. But in terms of innovation, I know in the predator-free space, 
where this government has invested substantially, with the Greens at the heart of it, to our landscape scale predator control to meet that predator free 2050 vision. And that has major benefits, not just for conservation, but also for farmers in terms of possum control, assisting with bovine TB. And internationally, a lot of um, countries are now watching what we're doing with rats, with possums and other predators. And there's been uh, opportunities for exports of innovation like the self-resetting uh, traps. So that's an area where I think we are being looked at internationally and quite a potential for um, selling these products to the world. Mark Cameron from the ACT Party. A couple of realities with, 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 with scientific, scientific research and R&D. The ACT Party would firstly, <coughs> excuse me, repeal the GE laws because quite, a lot, quite often there's a lot of technology locked up outside of New Zealand abroad that can mitigate a lot of the necessary difficulties we're having, especially if you're talking about, say, grass cultivars and new hybrid technology in that arena when it comes to herbages that reduce the amount of methane and re necessarily reduce the amount of CO2. The GE, GE framework doesn't allow for that. The ACT Party does not believe that government should go off on big subsidisations and or fundings of these sort of realities. There's a deep grievance that there is the potentiality that you then in, in a political football between who can lobby the government the most for funding. But what we do, we, we will do absolutely is promote industry driving its own initiatives and get a lot of the red tape and compliance that stops a lot of that out of the way. Mark Patterson from the New Zealand First Party. Um, well, yeah, and as I said uh, in the previous answer, there's a lot of stuff going on in the field of uh, you know methane uh, mitigation research and, and all that stuff. Uh, needs to have. We need, just need to throw the kitchen sink at funding. We, the, actually, the funding model for agricultural science needs overhauled. It's very clunky at the moment. It needs longer, uh, more secure timelines for the scientists to, uh, you know, to be able to properly execute uh, sort of blue skies uh, planning and and research. So that that's probably the the main area we would like to see uh, change. But you know, we look at the R and D tax credits that we've done. Uh, Callaghan Innovation, which we're right behind the Provincial Growth Fund, which has gotten behind things like the uh, Red Seaweed. Uh, there's a number of areas, but I think funding shouldn't be a problem. We, we need to fund these things, but uh, I think more broadly, it is the, the model of agricultural research funding that is uh, very clunky. The scientists are telling me it's very difficult to navigate. They're spending too much time on application and not enough time on research. So that, that's a key area of, of change we'd like to see. Uh, AgTech has been signaled by this government as a key area that, it, well, the previous government is a key area that wanted support. Uh, we were right behind that. Uh, it's a massive area of opportunity for us. And um, yeah, it's just a no brainer that we should leverage that uh, for international uh, export revenue. This is Sierra's Country. Well, you've just heard there from our five agricultural well, spokespeople with regards to the funding um, of agricultural science in this um, country, what their thoughts are around commercialising our agri-tech and what areas of science their p political party wants to focus on. Uh, the question was, how would your party support our innovators to commercialise science technology globally? And our expert commentator joining us tonight on Sarah's Country's election special is uh, Professor Rich McDowell, who is not only the Ag Research Principal Scientist, but also the Chief Scientist for the Our Land and Water National Science Challenge. And he joins us now. Good evening, Rich. Pleasure to be here again. Oh, it's wonderful having you on the show as always. And I couldn't think of a better person who would be able to give us an all-encompassing overview on funding science, agricultural science in this country, but also in terms of commercialising. I know ag research has a huge focus on New Zealand. Let's kick off with what we just heard there from Mark Patterson from New Zealand First. He said that they would throw the entire kitchen sink at funding, absolutely overhaul the process, which is being described as clunky. Uh, and, and supporting more blue sky science. Is he correct? Is our funding of agricultural science clunky and need overhauled? 
Well, any, any system um, has its foibles. And uh, I guess it's certainly true that we do spend an awful lot of time uh, preparing proposals. Uh, but you know, sometimes that's a good reason to ensure that there's uh, good quality science being done. And I, I was interested to, to hear, uh, I guess, the comments, not only from them, but uh, I guess from a couple of others there around, um, uh, around underpinning or, or blue sky science, as you could, as you could say. And it, you know, sometimes that can lead to un, you know, unexpected discoveries. And you know, it's also fun. Um, but that can also lead to quite a long time in terms of getting it out there and getting it adopted. So I, I do think that there is a role, um, I guess, for government and funding agencies, I guess, to set goals. Um, it, it often focuses the mind, I guess, of you know, us, us researchers. But, you know, that's, that's just my opinion. It's not necessarily the opinion of any of you know, the organisations that either I work in or represent. Yeah, absolutely, and that's why we did want you on the show, of course, for your personal opinion, and you've been in the game long enough. And Damien O'Connor said that sometimes it's more about the knowledge not being gathered in one place and make it readily available for extension of best practice on farm. Uh, What sort of things did the Our Land and Water Science Challenge come out with uh, to support the direction of this current coalition government's focus? Well, I guess you know, I'll draw back to the question, um, and it was a little bit longer than just funding the, the science and um, as it was commercialising it. And they, I think he, he was talking about the um, Sustainable Food and Fibre Futures Fund. A lot of S there, aren't there? Um, or S Triple F. And uh, yeah, I, I took note on that one because it, it's been around for twenty years. Yeah, you know, that's about as long as I've been involved in science in New Zealand, anyway. Um, and it's been around because it works. It uh, it joins together science and joins them with you know with farmers for for good practical solutions, solutions that are either either now or you know in the future, kind of ahead of the time. And it, it struck me, you know, there are many examples of, you know, success stories with, I guess, SFFF, but one that I guess I was involved in maybe in the, the late 2000s or early 2010s was with the dare industry. And um, I guess they were ahead of the time because they, they, they came up with their, um, their sustainable land care manual and they, they always have awards where they celebrate not only success in profitability but also environmental performance. That's continued to this day, I guess, and uh, I guess under the current um, policy regime, they've set themselves up for probably you know, good workable um, farm plans, um, which you could argue also helps them protect um, market access, especially when you consider, you know, I guess we supply the majority of the world's venison trade. And lastly, Rich, we have some uh, colliding uh, opposing sides, uh, as you would probably predict, between the Greens and ACT and, and Greens supporting uh, not commercialising our innovation as much as actually for science that is about our natural systems, uh, how to sequester carbon. ACT straight in there off the bat talking about supporting gene editing 100% and getting red tape and compliance out of the way. How does science choose uh, exactly what projects it does throw behind? Is it where, who is in in power at the time in terms of the what you study and scientifically or is that um you know you know uh, regardless of the government at the time yeah well <laughs> it's a mixed bag and so there's you know i mentioned blue skies we call that kind of discovery ground up science and then there's also very applied which is you know quite focused and that's where you, you know you partner with the industry for a specific um, specific target in mind. Um, often it's it's the latter, which you can you can see as more commercialisable. But you know, taking in mind that you know, Blue Skies does does produce stuff. Um, yeah, but I was I was reasonably impressed that all the politicians had um, you know awareness of not only the benefits of agricultural science but also technology. Um, and I think there was also comment not only about us being a lucky country, but also being quite a varied country. And you know, our uniqueness is not only our advantage, but also our disadvantage in some cases, and that we've got to understand that variation um, in not only our climate and soils, but also connect them to our can-do attitude, such that we can tailor 
I guess, not only products, but also practices that work from Northland to Southland. Mm. Yeah. Thank you so much for taking the time. Our expert commentator on this particular question uh, that is Principal Scientist for Ag Research and the Chief Scientist behind the Our Land and Water National Science Challenge, uh, Rich McDowell. It's always a pleasure having Rich on Sarah's Country as a regular uh, on an ongoing basis. I do want to continue to welcome all of our new live viewers that continue to join in the live stream as it gets darker outside and more and more come inside uh, to flick on the telly, the smartphone, the smart TV, or even if you are listening to us live on your phone while continuously cooking dinner or getting those little rugrats off to bed. Uh, and of course, on demand on podcast, never forget that. If you have been enjoying this, you can share that with your friends to ensure that they can watch uh, or listen Um uh, uh, afterwards as well. I'm enjoying your live comments. We are broadcasting tonight, especially on NZ Farming Facebook page, thanks to the team there. And we produce Serious Country in alliance with the fantastic team every week from Farmers Weekly. Now going down, Casey said it's a no-brainer that the SFFF invests in the future of the industry. How do we bring the fresh ideas um, last? Uh, to be fair to Eugenie, does not uh, to be greater there does need to be a greater understanding on our ecological and natural systems, particularly our farmed soils. And uh, Richard has said, why not invite scientists from all over New Zealand to collaborate on the methane question? Few extra high-yielding individuals through quarantine, I'm assuming you mean from overseas, then they could look around and get some answers for Miss Sage on just how valuable our farming systems are on the carbon footprint. And uh, there's a couple of comments coming in about who you are enjoying listening to. Eric has said, Mark Cameron sounds like a good horn. Um, becoming more swayed to act the more I hear from their candidates. And we've had uh, a supporter of the new Conservative Party slip into the comments and says that they do have excellent policies that support farming from day one, rejecting the ETS and the Carbon Zero Bill. Um, but more so... I want to talk about all of the places that you are tuning in, watching us live. Um, Bridget, an AI technician from the Waikato. Richard, a, rich, a research technician listening in from Palmerston North. And uh, South, South Africa, JC. Good work, mate. Ross from Taranaki. <laughs> Loving this one. Wade. Viewing from Invercargill, it's sunny out one window and it's raining out the other. Just another challenging Southland day. Really enjoying the discussion. And oh, I love this. Molly is a Lincoln University student watching inside from the miserable rain outside. Molly, isn't Wednesday's Yoldies Day? Um, but then in saying that, you'll be probably nearing the end of your term and your year, and I'm sure you'll be counting down and saving that liver for the almighty garden party this Friday. Uh, wonderful to see all of you tuning in on the wonderful thing we call broadband. We wouldn't be able to deliver a show like this uh, without it. And how far have we come in this past previous term of, of three years in politics? Uh, and how far do we need to go? It's a constant debate, but every politician will always say we need to do more. So in my fourth question to our political agricultural spokespeople for, for the five major parties, I started out by asking them, uh, uh, pointing out that farmers are increasingly expected to engage electronically now with business services and government agencies for regulation, as well as rural health services and geographically isolated communities was op uh, forced to operate on slow download speeds or data caps. I asked them all, what will your party do to improve rural broadband services? Uh, we just announced a, a few days ago another $60 million on top of the tens of millions that have been going out there. We've been identifying black spots. We've been identifying areas uh, around the country that, that have been struggling to get good broadband. Um, you know, we're getting up into the high 90% now, um, but that doesn't mean to say that, that each and every farmer, you know, has access to it. And we've been getting alongside the third tier providers, that's the wireless broadband providers who can uh, provide local solutions. Uh, the big players that have had, uh, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars over the last couple of governments uh, to roll out 
to backbone um, haven't always got to those little valleys. And so we have to give some money um, into those small providers that do provide realistic wireless solutions. Um, we do need to um, up, up, uh, increase and up, uh, update the, the um, cell phone network that we have. Increasingly, um, broadband is coming through the cell phone network, as I say, the black spots, uh, rollout that we've we've committed to, um, and other cell phone towers that have to be connected back through to the to you know the broadband network, um, they will be the way that we get uh, broadband and better communication out to our all our farmers. There will always be the odd one that uh, probably has to rely on satellite, um, but we're getting better. Um, upload speeds, download speeds, um, and cell phone networks out into rural New Zealand. David Bennett from the National Party. Well, I think um, our connectivity is fundamental at the moment, and COVID really showed that, that, uh, you know, you may have to work from home or on farm, where you always are working from home, uh, but uh, you need to be connected with the rest of the world, um, and you need to be connected within your communities as well, and it's really important um, in all parts of the farming community, from education of our children uh, to health, as you say, and also to uh, the ability to have best practice on farm. So the National Party is a very proud history in that area with the rural broadband scheme. Uh, you know, if you look at that, that would be probably one of the best schemes in the world for rolling out uh, broadband in New Zealand um, and in the rural and urban communities uh, through the two different phases of the scheme. Uh, that scheme has been carried on by the current government and we thank them for that, um, but there's still a lot more work to be done. Um, the original scheme had about 400 sites that were prepared um, or proposed and uh, about 150 of those have been completed. So as you can see, there's a lot of room still to be done there to, to get up to where we planned it to be. And, um, and also you can, you can see now in the communities that those number of sites uh, would not be sufficient, uh, that there is a lot of areas that are black spots and would want to have that technology as well. So we want to see an extension of that scheme and we want to see that scheme rolled out as fast as possible and um, we don't want any delays in that. So uh, we're committed to that in our agricultural policy um, of really having a strong emphasis on connectivity. Uh, along with that, other infrastructure as well. So uh, roading, for example, big investment that National is proposing in that area, which is infrastructure for communities, but also in that rural health area, um, it's talked about the rural health uh, commitments around having a third medical school with a rural health focus um, is really important as well. And that would enable delivery of services um, through technology as well. Eugenie Sage from the Green Party. Well, out door knocking in the Littleton Harbour Basin recently got a few complaints about the really slow speed of broadband, particularly during COVID, where you've got a number of um, people in the household wanting to get onto the internet. So I don't think it's just rural areas, it's some suburban areas as well. Uh, and really acknowledge the importance of ready access to broadband. So that was certainly an initiative that was started under the um, last government. So continuing to invest and uh, working out what are the priorities for upgrading services. I know, for example, on the west coast of the South Island, um, there's a big black spot there for cell coverage. Under this government, there's been um, sort of some more temporary repeaters put in to try and improve that and areas like that are definitely a priority for more investment and infrastructure to ena enable that connectivity which is such a critical part of all of our lives. Mark Cameron from the ACT Party. That's a simple answer. We've just got to continue in the, in the funding of it. I mean sadly in the far north I see this every day. We, we, we're right down to dial-up speed. So the ACT Party supports it, is very supportive of the continuation and funding of um, the necessary technologies that, that embolden, you know, the, the framework around broadband. It has to, we have to do it. The simple fact is we've got small businesses in many, many isolated areas that their greatest uh, pitfall is geographical, geographical isolation and their inability to access technology through the broadband system that we currently have and the technologies we currently have. Mark Patterson from the New Zealand First Party. Um, well, you know, I, I totally agree. I mean, I live in a rural area. I uh, travel through rural areas all the time and, and uh, experience uh, the connectivity issues and, and it's brought up 
uh, regularly. So we, we do have to invest more. We have invested massively through the RBI uh, two um, project uh, and the Provincial Growth Fund has actually um, also got into that space because it is really important and we want to see the Provincial Growth Fund continue. Labour are going to gut it. Um, we want to keep that uh, level of investment where it is now uh, so that we can do exactly those things that you're talking about because it is, and I think the COVID thing put it in stark uh, relief, didn't it? The, those that have good connectivity were able to get through uh, reasonably seamlessly, but those that don't, uh, and ag is increasingly a precision uh, business and you just can't operate without um, great broadband or you know, internet uh, and cell phone coverage. This is Sarah's Country. I am absolutely loving hearing from you live in the comments wherever you are watching across this beautiful wild world that is the web uh, as we talk about rural broadband there. Can I get to some of the comments? This is great. A shout out to the Massey Young Farmers Club. There's a flat full of lads from Massey tuning in watching right now from Palmerston North and it's currently blowing its ring out. And on the topic of wonderful ways to explain weather, no other than my father, who uh, it's not as hot as a bitch on heat, he'd like to normally say. It's as, This is a new one I've never heard of. Thanks, Dad. It's as cold as a witch's tit here. The frost's out tonight. Wonderful to hear from you, Dad. Now I'm going to uh, a wonderful subject expert commentator, no other than 2N CEO Craig Young, who joins us now. Craig, what do you make of that? Can't quite hear Craig. Ah, Kira, Sarah, sorry about that. <laughs> Wasn't the internet's <laughs> fault, was it? No, standard, standard, you know, someone's on mute. Yeah, you think I'd know better. What I was going to say was, look, I think that you can take a lot of positives out of that um, to start with. Everybody's on the same page and that we need to invest in improving rural broadband, whether it's catching up to urban and getting it back to um, some form of uh, service that can be used or putting more money in. Certainly they they have different views on what should be done next though. Yeah, now so let's talk about Labour and what um, they have been able to get their hands on the checkbook and actually do something with this term. Uh, announcing recently another $60 million and uh, believes that it needs to go in the hands of our local small providers. Um, even mm. though we've got over 90% of our coverage of this country um, at a sufficient level, so Damien O'Connor says, do mm. you really believe uh, that you know throwing more money at it is and has to be targeted this time? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, there's, there's a couple of things. One is that really they haven't done much during their term in, in government, mainly because the previous government let a large number of contracts just before the election last time. So we've been looking at the uh, rollout of that. Um, they did put some money in earlier in the year as part of the COVID reaction. Um, because as we know, there's, and I think I've talked to you about this before, there are significant parts of New Zealand where there was investment uh, several years ago that hasn't kept up and we've got capacity problems. So it's about 15 million to go into there. But like most government programs, it's uh, ASAP or when they get around to releasing the contracts. And then they've got another 60 million. I think what they've done is they've gone, what can we do in the short term? And they haven't really thought about the long term. Term. So what you're getting, I think, is from the current government, you're getting, here's a chunk of money, we know what needs to be done in the short term. And then you're getting from the National Party, you're getting, uh, here's a big chunk of money uh, for the next 10 years, um, but here's no detail. And so somewhere in between those two things, uh, I think we are right answers, because I think we need a 10-year view across all of government, whoever's in party, to bring rural broadband up to scratch. Mm, I've just got a comment here from Marie. There's no networks in the backcountry of the Taranaki and it's really expensive to get hooked up. No cell phone coverage whatsoever over these large parcels. And across um, Whanganui, Taranaki, all through that national um, park, if you're in the periphery of that, Sayonara, really. Um, and it's interesting, yeah. just picking up Mark Cameron at the Marks, Mark Cameron and Mark Patterson, both say they live this every day. Yet, yet mm. Eugenie didn't, she sounded like she knew it was a problem, but, you know, didn't really have anything tangible. 
Yeah, and if you don't live it each day, you don't really understand it. And I think, you know, particularly those that live in urban New Zealand, we get so comfortable realising, you know, that there's wonderful fibre service and, uh, you know, we can just live off that. But we know that rural New Zealand has a, a vast number of challenges. We know that the money that's gone into the wireless ISPs, the regional ones, has, you know, exponentially provided um, benefit. And so really pleased to hear the Minister last week saying that the money was going to go towards, you know, those sort of local solutions which I think is really important. Um, and there's got to be more that's targeted. And I think what we've got to also think about is we're not just going to chuck money at expanding coverage. We've got to improve what we've got, um, but we've also got to make sure that we uh, make the most of the technology that's coming. So it might be that we need to actually subsidise installation of things like new satellite uh, um uh, satellite uh, dishes on people's houses. There are new satellites in the air and they are way better than they used to be, significantly better. So, you know, some of these more really remote remote places might have a better service on a satellite, which is um, a new type and that the government should put some money into actually helping them. It's almost getting down to the point of house by house or property by property. And one of the things that came out in our recent symposium from the WISP is we don't actually know who's not connected. We have an idea, but we don't actually know who and what the problems are. And that's one of the things I'd like to see done in the next term is actually sit down and come up with a view on, you know, who who isn't who hasn't got it and what can we do to fix it? Hey, governments love a good old working party and a good old review to throw some money at. That could be one. Yeah. Another big well, survey. One. No, no, I'd like it to actually be something we could use. Exactly. So, you know, no, I was yeah, saying it could be a possibility yeah. you could get across the line. Well, you know, the telcos know who they've got connected and what service they, they're giving them. They just aren't that good at sharing it um, with others so that we can actually see across the board. And I think that's probably one of the other things that, um, you know, rural is really good at collaborating and working across the paddock and across the fence. Why can't we encourage the industry to do so as well? Mm, mm. Oh, absolutely. I hear you. And I tell you what, uh, Rural are also really good at saying, give me the bucket of money and we'll get on with it and get it done as well. Across yeah. the board on a lot of topics we're talking here tonight. Thank you so much, CEO for Two Ends, the Telecommunication Users Association of New Zealand, Craig Young. Uh, love to hear what your experience is in being able to stream a show like this uh, and also how what type of internet connection you're on and what have you done to be able to improve it for yourself. You're listening to Serious Country uh, and watching across multiple platforms on our election special. Now the last topic that I really want to get uh, your thoughts on as well as our last expert commentator following the question that I put to our five agricultural spokespeople. This is one of the most urgent and major, especially with climate change and change of land use uh, across this country. All New Zealanders, every single one of us, whether we rely on it from a rural property or within urban New Zealand, we are reliant on accessing water when it's needed. And uh, of course, increasing weather patterns, dry weather patterns will make us more and more vulnerable. We are really starting to feel the reality of this and hopefully our politicians are getting their head around the major job it is, uh, shovel ready or not. I asked all of them, how will your party enable pragmatic solutions for the benefit of both rural and urban areas and provide that urban urgent infrastructure? And look, we have spent uh, literally tens uh, and up to $100 million on water infrastructure. Um, it, it, it actually, it's across drinking water, wastewater and stormwater for the small towns. But of course, for water storage, for irrigation uh, and agriculture, where you know there's been extensive use of that and will continue to be so in the future as the climate changes and, and some areas get drier and drier. So we're, we're not only supporting um, actually the projects themselves, uh, such as in Northland, uh, but we're actually um, improving uh, the level of knowledge. So we're going out investigating more possible schemes. Many people have talked about schemes around country in all the dry regions, but they haven't had the ability to go and, and do the research. So uh, that's what we'll be looking to do. Um, and as I say, as a government, we understand the climate is going to change. It will affect the way that we farm. Our reliance on water will increase and that we're committed to and will continue to spend money on water storage as a core part of support for 
our primary sectors. David Bennett from the National Party. This is a fundamental uh, policy that we just released last week around water storage and water infrastructure. So there, there are many arguments um, within this issue. And, um, and so we'll, we'll start with sort of the, the base issue is that you need water uh, for resilience in time of dry weather, but also uh, for growth. And effectively, horticulture um, is one of our huge growth areas in the primary sector going forward, and um, it needs water. Um, you can't grow kiwi fruit um, and apples and, and other horticultural products to the extent that we want to without good water sources. And uh, that is the prime issue within horticulture at the moment, uh, making sure there's that access to water. Now, unfortunately, the government, um, current government, has cancelled the water projects that were going to be in train that we had in a previous um, iteration of the Crown Irrigation. Um, and they've only carried on the ones they had to. And then they've only had a couple of small projects they've done in recent years. And, and they've, they've made it very clear they're not into major scale water storage. Uh, they only want very small projects. And that doesn't achieve the purpose um, of resilience that you talk about, and also of growth. So that's the first point. Uh, second point is that New Zealand is a lucky country. We have a lot of water resources, and, um, and we need to store and use that water. Uh, we're one of the few countries in the world that have that resource of that scale for the size of our country. And um, we simply um, are afraid to use it. And, um, and we're told it's a bad thing to use water storage when we actually need to embrace it uh, because that's our economic potential going forward. Now, the third issue is that the, the movement away from the word irrigation to the, to the words um, urban, rural, and environmental is, is a key component of any water storage proposal these days. So um, going back to you know, that irrigation issue, that, that raises the, the conjecture of whether it's about dairy farming, increased emissions and such like. Whereas if you look at it from a, a resilience point of view and you have a, an urban aspect, a rural aspect and an environmental aspect, uh, then water storage really takes on its own new light. And, and a great example of that is in Timaru, for example, in that area, um, there's a water storage project uh, there that would you know, enable development of the land between the water storage project and the city. Um, would enable the city to have water for um, its industrial purposes and it would also enable some environmental outcomes like around the lagoon and river flows in the summer. So there's the potential of meshing together all three. So what we've done, is we've proposed a $600 million fund that would be available for water infrastructure upgrades and also water storage. So for places like Auckland, uh, water infrastructure upgrade is crucial for them uh, to get their water supply. Um, and for rural areas and provincial areas, the water storage will be a major issue. So uh, we're giving the opportunity um, for all to be involved and uh, that will be a major impact um, on our productive sectors and the ability for us to continue to grow, especially in the horticulture sector. Eugenie Sage from the Green Party. In urban areas, uh, it's quite critical that we have much more sustainable water conservation measures, uh, things like uh, households having uh, rainwater tanks that they can then use to water gardens in summer without impacting on the uh, reticulated supply. Uh, and it's about people being more water savvy generally. I think we've got a lot to learn from Australia. It's about uh, looking at how we at the wider landscape level, look at issues like fire management as well, um, which are another issue as a result of uh, unstable weather patterns, increasing periods of drought. And in rural areas, our uh, farming for the future policy is about enabling small scale uh, water storage on farm and more focus and research into dryland type crops, things like quinoa, uh, things like hemp, and work there to look at crops which don't need as much water as, say, dairying does in areas like the uh, Mackenzie. So it's a, um, a mosaic of measures, and we do have to think long term about this and really invest in some smart thinking. Mark Cameron from the ACT Party. Look, the, the simple reality is, is that we, would, as the ACT Party, would go straight to the RMA. I mean, other party, parties have used this as a political football pre-election 
for many election cycles. We've advocated this for a long time. We've got to repeal and replace that. That all too often, that 900 page document actually stops getting things done at a central government level, a regional level, and right down to the farm gate. So the first thing we do is work about getting rid of the RMA in the current format and repeal and replace it. When you talk about water storage at a council level, councils around the country, regions around the country, know their, their own physical uh, topography, the normal, the seasonal variations in rainfall, the normal climate. And, you know, I mean, you compare Northern to, to the South Islands, the prime example. We're a wonderfully skinny little country stretched from one end to the other. So we've really got to have a tailored solution. The worst thing is we make this a central government reality. So the government should get out of the way of council where as possible so council can create these solutions um, and government streamline the funding to create it. Mark Patterson from the New Zealand First Party. Yeah, well, we've been massive uh, proponents of water storage within the previous government. In fact, the Provincial Growth Fund uh, funded 37 uh, water storage projects at various stages of uh, their uh, conception. Uh, uh, 90 odd million dollars there. Uh, we honoured the previous uh, Crown Infrastructure Irrigation Investment, or the main ones that were in the advanced stages. Uh, and we think that this is the lowest of low hanging fruit for agriculture. We need to mitigate against climate change. What we would want to see is a national stock take actually, rather than it being kind of driven totally by the on the ground grassroots farmers trying to pull things together and uh, get a a scheme up and running for government funding. We actually think there's room for some top-down strategic looking into this, identify where the opportunities are and work with those uh, farmers on the ground and, and local councils uh, because we've got a lot of water, uh, but just don't get it at the right time uh, in the right place. And it's, it's of incredible strategic national importance that we leverage those resources that we have. This is Sarah's Country. Well, we just heard there lastly from Mark Patterson about, you know, rain not being the issue. It's about how we capture it and redistribute it uh, as being the problem. The question I asked them at the start of you've just joined us here on Sarah's Country's election special was how will your party enable pragmatic solutions for the benefit of both rural and urban areas? And what would you do to provide that ur ur urgent infrastructure? Uh, and our expert commentary on this particular there is no other I believe uh, at the moment is uh, the current CEO of Irrigation New Zealand Elizabeth Sol, who joins us now on this election special evening Liz um, there's quite a few different views going on there before we get into some of the um, bureaucracy around water uh, infrastructure. I want to go straight to those comments out Eugenie Sage's mouth with regards to us looking to Australia um, to mitigate fires, especially following the Lake Ohau fire situation. It seems like a very interesting comment to make. Yeah, it is. And um, certainly when we think about uh, water storage and the options that it provides for communities as a whole, um, providing water for firefighting um, purposes is absolutely one way that we can use water and should be available for the community. We know that increased fire risk is something that's going to happen under climate change. And so how we manage our water, um, because that's going to be a risk, is absolutely something that we should be taking into account. Mm, and mitigating pr the prevention of fire. I know there'll be a lot of people watching and listening will be thinking mm. about that as opposed to, of course, putting out that fire. So, of course, uh, National wanting to go straight back to the Crown uh, Irrigation Investment Fund they, they established, naturally understandable um, about large storage and rolling back uh, a lot of the infrastructure. What would you feel confident that National would get underway should they be elected uh, post Saturday and some of those previous uh, projects that a lot of people have been hanging their hats on? 
Yeah, so um, I think what's um, positive about that about their policy is that it looks at um, investing in irrigation infrastructure and water storage infrastructure as just that, an investment, um, because um, we know that our river systems and our um, rainfall patterns are going to be so different under climate change that actually it's really important that we look at investing significantly now in irrigation and water storage in general infrastructure to enable um, enable us to respond to climate change, but also to enable um, boosts to regional economies, um, particularly in a post-COVID world, because it will allow for um, economic development. So we would have liked for there to be more um, investment in uh, water storage projects as part of those infrastructure projects that have been invested in as shovel-ready responses to the COVID-19 um, crisis. So there's a lot that aren't necessarily shovel aren't necessarily shovel ready, but are certainly on the list of projects that would certainly support our regions and the country as a whole. And this is not to see an expansion in dairy necessarily. I know in the North Canterbury area, there's a huge expansion in horticulture happening in that particular area, as well as many other uh, land uses that can benefit from this and also the economies of scale of an urban supply um, and the environmental uh, mitigation and our wildlife and fisheries as well. So, I mean, overarching, what has Labour, this Labour Green Net New Zealand First Coalition, been able to achieve in this space? Damien opened up saying we've spent hundreds of millions of dollars. Where has those dollars landed? Yeah, so there has certainly been investment through the Provincial Growth Fund um, in water storage projects in Northland, um, uh, Hawke's Bay and Wairarapa and looking at water infrastructure more generally. And so that is a positive and, and our sector is very pleased that that is going ahead, particularly in those areas like Northland um, where there is a lot of economic potential that can be gained from investing in um, water infrastructure. Um, so that is a positive. Um, what the next government would look like um, if there isn't a provincial growth fund in place, that's that's more of a concern for us. It's not necessarily that the that um, communities want to receive grant funding or handouts for irrigation infrastructure or water storage infrastructure, but it's about providing the supporting um, environment in terms of regulations and that sort of thing to enable some of these projects to get off the ground and bringing together all the um, different parts of the community that can benefit from water storage um, so that those who share the benefits are also sharing the costs as well. And Mark Cameron there, to finish from ACT, was uh, really quick to judge the RMA and the reform on the table, the support for regional councils to be able to see the paperwork and the process, the long years and years and sometimes decades for these particular uh, infrastructure projects to actually get to, as you said, putting the shovel in the ground. That's right. I mean, um, it's interesting because often actually getting the pipes in the ground is one of the easiest parts in the process. Um, but you're absolutely right. It can take over 10 years, if not more, to get these projects from conception through to build stage. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that. So some of it is through the consenting process, and but it's not just that. It can be for a uh, a range of reasons, but absolutely there's processes under the RMA that could be improved um, to enable some of these um, projects to go ahead a lot more quickly. And the government has said that that can happen under their um, faster track consenting process that, that, that will occur for some of those um, infrastructure projects that they've announced under the COVID-19 response. But it's something that we need to look at more generally as to the effectiveness and efficiency of the RMA planning process to enable these sorts of things to happen. Liz, 2017 election was the election of water. Uh, how are you feeling three years on and the progress that we have made and uh, where the consensus lies between those five parties we've just heard from? Yeah, so it certainly was. Um, the, uh, water was a hot topic in the freshwater regulations um, and what was proposed um, in the policy manifestos that the various parties put out before the last election was extremely, um, it, it led to a lot of firm discussion in the community, can I put it that way? Um we haven't seen those sorts of issues being raised as election issues per se, um, but it is good that most of the parties have water um, on their agendas. It's just that they're not all given the same priorities that they are. Uh, as I've said before, we have um, been 
consistent in our messaging to all political parties that there needs to be an overarching water strategy guiding New Zealand and that we need to have planned sustainable investment in water infrastructure for all sectors in the community because it's only going to get worse under climate change and so we are still hopeful that, that whoever's in government next will prioritise this and um, recognise it for the critically important issue that it is. Thank you so much. The CEO of Irrigation New Zealand, Elizabeth Sol, there is an, our expert commentator on this particular question around the urgent water infrastructure and where each of those political parties stand. Well, we've had a huge show in Sarah's Country's election special covering off not only those five major issues, but those bonus policies that you just uh, heard there from them in terms of those extras that they wanted to bring to the table. That was their choice, uh, what they chose. I thought it would be a most appropriate to bring to the table to summarise and wrap up our election special with no other than the editor of Farmers Weekly, Brian Gibson, who is dealing with all topics uh, in terms of the future of our food and fibre sector here in New Zealand on an ongoing basis. Having the privilege of sitting in the news meetings, the content meetings at uh, Global HQ in fielding via Zoom, the intelligence and depth and breadth of experience and knowledge in agricultural journalism is something to be in awe of in those meetings. And they are dealing with these topics on an ongoing basis. They've heard it all from opinion uh, makers in the paper, Farmers Weekly, uh, as well as across uh, industry developments. And of course, uh, in the last couple of weeks, all of the major parties' political uh, policies and agendas. And joining us now is Brian from Fielding. Brian, what do you make of everything you've just heard? To be honest, the big theme for me was the amount of consensus that there was among the parties. Um, I mean, at the last election, if we just go back three years, agriculture was one of the sort of political footballs that was being um, kicked about and it was, um, you know, it got a bit rough at times. Um, But this year... There seems to be more agreement on um, the direction of the industry. Um, Obviously, the way you get there is the sticking point, and that's always in the details. Um, And I guess this year, like always, it revolves around your ideology, whether you believe that um, big government and regulation is the way to get there or whether um, industry leadership or a hybrid of both is the way to go. Mm. What about those bonus policies? Was it interesting who chose what and what that reflects of their priorities? Two out of the five choosing wool. Who thought wool would have been uh, high on the agenda this election in comparison to water in 2017? Yeah, I guess, um, I mean, wool's been a a, a sort of a problem child for the industry for quite some time now. Um, We all know it's a wonderful fibre, and with the focus in the world moving away from petrochemicals and, um, you know, microbeads and that sort of thing, then it seems sort of common sense that natural fibres like wool should be front and centre and, you know, in everyone's shopping trolleys. And the fact that they're not yet is um, um, a bit of a head strike a head scratcher. So, um, you know, obviously um, the current government set up the wool working group. They've um, come up with the, um, the, uh, a strategy and a new group to um, charge ahead with that. Um, And so, yeah, like I guess wool is something that really needs a kick. Mm, And I think what I'm most proud of is that the five major issues and policies that we are focusing on as an industry and want our politicians' opinions and policy on are predominantly environmental-based. Yeah, look, I mean, the world moves pretty quickly. And, um, you know, farmers, like everyone else and every other industry, needs to move with it. And so I think, as we heard tonight, um, most of the um, spokespeople know that things like greenhouse gas emissions and freshwater quality are vital to our viability as a sector. Um, it's just how you how you improve those things and um, measure them and then tell that story to the world, um, which are the sticking points. Mm. Lastly, Brian, before you go, thank you so much for that wonderful rep. Is 
about the language that we use and what the sort of rhetoric is coming from government as well as, of course, from media and in your day-to-day job as the editor of Farmers Weekly, it's an interesting one to navigate. Can you share with our audience uh, with so many opinions and divisiveness across direction of our sector, how you manage to portray that on a weekly basis? Uh, Yeah, that's an interesting one. Um, We have... You know, in the paper, we kind of have sort of two roles. One is to advocate for the the farming sector, and the other one is to give them all the information they need to know to be the best that they can be. Um, And so it always is a sort of a fine line between, um, you know, uh, representing their views on things like uh, regulations, uh, you know, reform, that sort of thing, and then also... um, doing things like um, showing where the world is going. Um, uh, We had a story recently with our, um, you know, uh, Vangelis Vitalis, our lead trade negotiator, saying that things like freshwater reform and greenhouse gas emissions were vital to us striking trade deals. And these are things that, you know, uh, if you're working away in your office or in your, um, um, you know, on your farm, you might not know that these things are that important, Um, but they really are. Um, And so, yeah, there is a, a... a line to walk there. Um, we do the best we can, I guess. Mm. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much uh, from our audience, both listening and viewing to this election special uh, and all that you do for us in the sector, Brian. You're tirelessly working in the background there as editor of Farmers Weekly. That's Brian Gibson to summarise and wrap up uh, Sarah's country. I'm absolutely honoured to see how many of you are still watching uh, live as we've gone over, well over what I said, an hour and a half, two hours. But hey, why kill it when you're having fun? I do apologise on behalf of my team and myself for that play out of the the double up there with the rural broadband. But it was certainly well worth uh, making sure that we played right through to the end. And uh, we had a series of bonus policy round uh, that I have saved as a treat for you on demand. One of the favourite policies that each of those spokespeople wanted to ensure that we had further detail around. You will be able to access these special edition, the little two or three minute bite-sized grabs on demand, Serious Country's podcast, or of course on Farmers Weekly's YouTube, first thing in the morning. Now I talked to Damien O'Connor about what he will continue to do with wool, as this is strong wool, as well as Mark Patterson from New Zealand First strongly wanted to talk about what New Zealand First would do and getting wool into government buildings. If you're following the wool industry, make sure you check them out. David Bennett said National will come to the aid of the primary sector's labour shortage. He talks more in detail about that. Uh, And Mark Cameron, extremely passionate about rural mental health, following a bout of depression himself as a dairy farmer and how ACT want to fix rural mental health and of course uh, Eugenie Sage didn't miss the opportunity to talk about hunting and conservation. You can catch Sarah's Country on podcasts on demand first thing in the morning as well as uh, we are on demand uh, in association with the great team at farmersweekly.co.nz. Proud to bring you this 2020 election special and of course the privilege to broadcast on NZ Farming's Facebook page uh, and a lot of new listeners and watchers around the country tonight because of that extended coverage. So thank you so much to all of you who have uh, stuck around with us. Uh, it's been an absolute honour and privilege to be with you for the last couple of hours and in the meantime we will see you back here Monday at 7pm. In the meantime take care of yourself, your loved ones, your families, your communities uh, and, and, and we will see you again next week. This is Sarah's Country.